Hello, my name is David Foster. We're going to take a look at continued fractions. Uh, these are a very interesting uh, mathematical entity that we don't often talk about very much. They have some very interesting practical uses as well as some kind of screwy um, numerical ones, um, number theory ones. Okay, so what's a continued fraction? You know, it's just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction and so forth. It's really all it is. I prefer the term nested fra fraction. Okay, so what is, let's take a look at an example. Golden ratio. Um, love, well known and well loved since Greek times. That's simply 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over and so forth. And now I could uh, say this whole thing out, but it gets really tiresome really fast. For you especially. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Here we have pi. And I have two different ones. Um, this top one is, I'll explain in just a moment, a simple continued fraction. And pi doesn't have a really pretty simple continued fraction. Um, but as a more general fraction, continued fraction, oh yeah, real pretty. Um, that's pi right there. And of course, notice each of these go off to infinity. Uh, we do this over and over and over. Kind of like a decimal. Pi as a decimal goes on forever. Well, pi as a continued fraction goes on forever. Um, likewise, the number e. Everybody loves the number e. I love the number e. Um, 2 plus 2 over 2 plus uh, 3 over 3 plus 4 over... Yeah, yeah. I won't try to read all that. I confuse myself. But the... Uh, yeah, that's what E is, and that, that's a very interesting pattern. Okay, now for one of the practical uses, let's take a look at this. And you guys can double check this, and it works out just fine. So, uh, this, if we start with the square, square root of x equals 1 plus x minus 1 over 1 minus x squared, x, the square root of x, pardon, then we can say, hey, well, what's the square root of x? Well, we know the square root of x. So we plug it in there and we nest it over and over and over infinitely. So we get something like this. Well, this is what we get, in fact. The square, root of, the square root of x equals 1 plus x minus 1 over 2 plus x minus 1 over 2 plus blah, 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 blah. Which means that we can take this and we could just we want, we want to know what square root of x, uh, square root of two is. Yeah. Set, equal, set x equals two, and solve. Now, of course, in, in in practice, we can't go on forever. We have to plug it into a computer or a calculator, or, or just start scribbling numbers on paper at some point. So we truncate it. We just cut it off there and say, okay, start calculating. We just forget about this part right here. We just start calculating, and you know, works it will converge to the square root. The square root. Makes it a very useful property. Okay, so as I said, in practice, most continued fractions are simple and finite. Simple just means um, that the numerator is one. That's all it means. And, and the, uh, the, a, the a's are all positive integers. So no negative funny business here. And in practice, they're finite, which means that instead of going off forever, we cut it off and just say, okay, get to start calculating, which is a surprisingly common philosophy in both math and physics, I find. Shut up and calculate. Now let's, let's do some calculating ourselves. See, see what we get. Um, let's start with x minus q times x minus r equals zero. That's, that's pretty straightforward. That can't possibly be weird. We know that roots are q and r by construction. This is no grade stool stuff. Um, let's foil it. So we get x squared minus q plus rx plus qr equals zero. Reasonable. Let's move the, uh, the, uh, the two rightmost terms to the right side. And we get, oh, and then we divide both sides by x. So we get x equals q plus r minus qr over x. Okay, pretty straightforward. We just, um, we know what x is because x is this. So we just plug everything here back into here again 
and we get something like this. Okay, so x equals q plus r minus qr over... Uh, don't make me say the whole thing. You don't want me to go there. But you, you, you see it, go, it going on forever. So let's take a look at an example. Examples are fun. Uh, x plus 2 times x minus 3 equals 0. Okay, I, I do as before. And we get uh, x equals 1 plus 6 over 1 plus 6 over 1 plus 6 over blah blah blah. This converges to 3. But we had two roots. We also had negative 2 as a root. Let's take a look what happens if we, if we, if we try to put that in. x equals 1 plus 6 over 1 plus 6 over 1 plus 6 over, and let's, let's just, just stick negative 2 in here. Uh, okay, 6 over negative 2, that's going to be negative 3. 1 plus negative 3 is negative 2. Okay, so we're back down to here now. 6 over negative 2, that's negative 3, plus 1 is negative 2. So we're 6 over negative 2, that's negative 3, so 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Okay, so I want to point this out, and it will seem very strange. I, to me it is very strange and fascinating. This is when you have an infinite continued fraction, it can be dual valued. That's not so particularly strange. I mean, a square root can be dual valued. What's the square root of 4? Is it 2 or negative 2? Well, it's both. Um, we might say 2 is the principal value, but the uh, both are perfectly valid answers. Uh, negative 2 times negative 2 is 4, just as 2 times 2 is 4. But both work just fine. Okay, so we, we could also go triple valued if we want. It's not a regular continued fraction by any means. Um, it's kind of its own entity. I start with uh, x minus j times x minus l squared plus k equals zero. And then, of course, this one, this quasi, uh, quasi in a very rough sense, continued fraction, involves squares. But, uh, yeah, it gives us uh, triple values, which I just find peculiar, considering you'd think it would be a perfectly finite, calculable number. Okay, now this one's going to be a little bit more screwy. Um, I'll start with x minus a times x minus n sub m equals zero. Okay, so we saw this as before, x equals a plus n sub m minus a n sub m over, a, over x. Well, let's, let, let's just fix a. So a is going to be negative 1. We let an n, well, we'll let n change. Because why not? I mean, no matter what happens, a will be an answer, right? So I'm going to plug this in and let... Um, x become, well, one, o 1 over 1 plus 2 over 2 plus 3 over 3 plus 4 over, oh, okay, very pretty, very pretty, very nice. We saw this earlier, though. So we know by construction this is negative 1, but we remember from earlier that this is e. Um, of course, it's off by 1, so this is e minus 1. Very tricky. Um, once again, it has dual values. It converges to e by certain, certainly. I, um, you, can, you can pull up the calculation on your calculator or math software or wolframalpha.com or whatever. But, uh, yeah, it converges to e. Well, e minus 1. But we can put zero, negative 1 in. Okay, if we put negative 1 in um, here, so 4 over negative 1 gives us negative 4. 3 minus negative 4, that's minus 1. Uh, so 3 over minus 1 is negative 3. 2 minus negative 3, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Uh, 2 over negative 1 is negative 2. 1 minus 
2 is minus 1. When the negative 1 is a solution, even though it does not converge to it. Now, I, sh I should point out real quickly that just because it doesn't converge to it, an answer, uh, that, isn't, that isn't a death knell. Convergence isn't everything. Convergence is, in, in the real world, a very useful, extremely important principle. Um, it's not the end-all and be-all of existence, though. The, uh, you know, it, 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 that's the first thing you learn, in, one of the first things you learn in pre-calc when you're doing uh, limits, is that just because it, it, you're getting close to a number doesn't mean that's actually the limit. So, that's something to keep in mind. Now, something I want to point out here is that when, it's, when we have a finite one, when, we've, when it only goes down so many levels, then it's single-valued. And that's, you know, algebra is just what you'd expect. It's long, it's complicated, whatever. It's straightforward. When it's infinite, we have a more peculiar situation. It's not necessarily single-valued. Um, I'm going to come back to this later because I think this is a very interesting principle. By later, I mean in future videos. Because I'm going to apply this later to nested radicals and to divergent series, such as the infamous 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals negative 1 twelfth. The second point I think is important to look at is closure. Okay, closure is just a fancy word that means if you, uh, you add two numbers, you should get one of those same kind of numbers. Imagine, you know, it's like if you put a couple bunnies in a closet and you got a cow out. You know, th that would not be closure. Because when you put bunnies in a closet with, you know, food and water and whatever, you should get more bunnies, not cows. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. We're sticking in some nice, rational numbers, some bunnies, and we're getting a whole side of beef out. Uh, this, is, this is a very interesting phenomenon, which tells me that even though we're dealing with a bunch of fractions, when we're doing it infinitely, we don't have a rational um, structure anymore. We have some sort of real number expression. Even, even if it's entirely composed of integers. So, once again, closure. Now, this, this seems very kind of trite here, why I'm emphasizing it, because a little bit later, in future videos, this will seem very significant. Because we're going to see some things that we would expect closure, but we don't see. So, um, let's just start off with uh, some continued fractions. Let's think about this. And hopefully I'll come back next week with a little bit more. Thank you guys, and have fun.